Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you all so much for joining us this evening. This is Left Bank Books presents Shelley Oria, Khadija Queen, Deb Olin Unferth, and Mary Jo Bang for I Know What's Best for You, Stories on Reproductive Freedom. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the, support, the supporters of Shelley, Khadija, Deb, Mary Jo, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. Left Bank Books offers in-store shopping, curbside pickup, and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. We are happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoy this event, and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a copy for you or for all of your friends on our website at left-bank.com. Purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating, and it allows us to continue bringing you incredible programs such as the program we are about to encounter this evening. I am Shane Mullen. I am the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. We produce hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event, so you can type your questions as a comment. Be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook and YouTube to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. We have a lot of in-person events planned for this summer, but we continue to offer virtual events and hybrid events to the virtual world. You can join our events from near or far, and be sure to check out our event calendar on our website for full details about our upcoming event programming. About tonight's book. Peter Ho Davies, the author of A Lie Someone Told You About Yourself, says, an urgent, vital collection of essays and fiction by turns frank and fierce, beautiful and brave. Such voices and stories are too often silenced or unspoken. It's a gift to hear them now and a duty to listen. Edited by Shelley Oria, author and editor of Indelible in the Hippocampus, this explosive intersectional collection of essays, fiction, poems, plays, and more explores the universality of human reproductive experiences, as well as their distinct individuality. An unlisted sailor must choose between her military career and keeping an unexpected pregnancy. A mother of three decides to become a surrogate, but is unprepared for everything that happens next. A trans man's pregnancy forces them to approach their key relationships in a new way. A woman's choice to live a child-free life is put to the test when her husband's dying wish is for them to become parents. Forced sterilization camps line the borders of America in a dystopian future that may not be far off. In their own unique and unforgettable way, each storyteller examines our crisis of access to care in ways that are at turns haunting, heartbreaking, and outright funny. This collection is a collaboration with the Bridget Alliance, a nationwide service that arranges and funds confidential and personal travel support to those seeking abortion care. And now about tonight's speakers, which I'm so excited for. Shelley Oria is the author of New York One, Tel Aviv Zero, and the editor of Indelible in the Hippocampus, writings from the Me Too movement, as well as the forthcoming I Know What's Best for You, Stories on Reproductive Freedom, which is out now. Her fiction has appeared in the Paris Review and on selected shorts at Symphony Space, received a number of awards, and been translated to several languages. Mary Jo Bang is the author of eight books of poems, including A Doll for Throwing and Elegy, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award. A translation of Dante's Inferno, illustrated by Henrique Drescher, and a translation of Purgatorio. She has received a Hotter Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a Berlin Prize Fellowship. She's a professor of English at Washington University in St. Louis, where she teaches creative writing. Colonies of Paradise, Translations of Poems by the German poet and novelist Matthias Goritz is forthcoming from Triquarterly Books in October. Khadija Queen is the author of six books of poetry in hybrid prose, most recently Anodyne, winner of the William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America. 
Individual works appear in Plowshares, American Poetry Review, The Offing, Harper's Magazine, The New York Times, The Poetry Review, and widely elsewhere. She holds a PhD in English from University of Denver. Deb Olin Unferth is the author of six books, including the novel Barn 8. Her fiction and essays have appeared in Harper's, The Paris Review, Granta, Noon, Conjunctions, and McSweeney's. She was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, three Pushcart Prizes, and a Creative Capital Fellowship for Innovative Literature. She is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And now, I am so incredibly proud and pleased to welcome our guests, our incredibly award-winning guests for tonight, Shelley Oria, Khadija Queen, Deb Olin Unferth, and Mary Jo Bang. And I'm welcoming everyone to the screen except Hi. for Khadija. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Hi. So lovely Hi. to be here. Hi, everybody. Great to see everyone. Yeah, it's so good to see you all. And I have to say it is so lovely on the heels of three weeks of uh, many travels on behalf of this book to be in St. Louis from my Brooklyn apartment. Um, that feels awesome. I'm, I'm grateful to technology in this moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on the book. I was saying just before that I have been reading it and they're, they're just, I just love it so much. I was so, I was so taken with so many of the essays. I mean, I just keep reading them. I keep putting down the book and just feeling like I'm moving back to my my other reading stack. And then I keep picking it back up again. I'm like, I'll just read one more. I'll just read one more. And then I'm like, oh, I haven't read anything by this person before. Let me read this. I mean, I've just been, I'm really impressed with just the incredible diverse opinions and outlooks and just approaches to the questions and, um, I love it. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Deb. That, that means the world. It really makes, it makes me so happy Shelley, to hear that. You accomplished something Herculean here. I remember the editing process of us going back and forth. And I also just co-edited an anthology myself. And I know that it is very hard work, a labor of love, and it requires clear vision. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you so much. Shelly, 10% of sales for this book go to the Bridget Olin? 25. It was, it, it was 10, and then, you know, Friday happened, and McSweeney's are, everyone there is just so full of heart, and the moment that happened, suddenly they were like, no, it's going to be 25. We need to do mm -hmm. more. Um, they're also covering shipping through the end of the month, so the 25% to the Bridget Alliance is, a, is an effort for seven days, so it's still on for the next three days. July 1 is July 1st is the deadline for that. The shipping is covered through the end of um, July. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. All right, we'll are we ready to- And did you say what the Bridget Alliance right is? Yeah, so I'm, I'm saving yeah. that for the forward. Otherwise it'll feel like I'm repeating myself. Okay. I'm about to say that in the forward and then Great. we can talk more about it later in the Q and A if people have questions about Bridget for sure. Great. Um, um, yeah, should I just jump in? Yep. All right, so I'm gonna start by reading um, a sort of excerpted version of the forward, which kind of saves both me and audiences from me having to talk about the book, which tends to not be the most interesting thing. Um, so it kind of gives an idea of what the book is and a little bit of the inception story, but I'll be skipping parts so we can come back to it at the Q&A at the end if people have questions. Books are soulful beings that come into our fast world slowly. While they're being written, revised, edited, copy edited, and published, the world around them shapeshifts. When I began to curate this book at the end of 2019, I would often calm myself down by watching videos of Ruth Bader Ginsburg performing TRX push-ups. She's well, the videos would whisper to me. She's strong, breathe. The world since then has changed its shape. A few months earlier, on a sunny Saturday, I met Carol Davis for lunch in Manhattan's West Village. Carol co-founded the Bridget Alliance, a nonprofit that arranges and pays the way for individuals across the country forced to travel for abortion care. And now she was discussing with McSweeney's a potential collaboration, an anthology that would respond to her urgent reproductive freedom crisis. 
I had just curated and edited another anthology from McSweeney's, Indelible on the Hippocampus, Writings from the Me Too Movement, and Amanda Yuli, McSweeney's publisher, asked if I'd take on this new project, a book she hoped would be similar in format and spirit. I arrived at that lunch thinking I was versed in the topic of reproductive freedom that I understood our crisis and its circumstances. But as I listened to Carol, I realized the situation was far more dire than I knew. And I'll be skipping ahead now, so anyone wanting to read horrible statistics, um, that's page 10 in the book. One could put together a powerful book, 10 powerful books, filled with stories of abortion or the lack of access to one in today's America. But I felt drawn to a broader approach and invited writers and artists to respond to any aspect of reproductive freedom with which they connected. Miscarriage, fertility, contraception, surrogacy, child freeness, and of course, abortion. My experience with Indelible and the Hippocampus offered insight that made this wide lens feel essential. And I'm skipping again here, um, which is where I explain the wide lens approach, if anyone is super curious about that. That's my little cliffhanger um, trick to get you to buy the book. Um, the stories in this book, by which I mean the short fiction and personal essays, the poems and plays, the comic and photographs, have not only deepened and changed my understanding of reproductive freedom, but managed to do so while making me laugh and making me somehow, against all odds, optimistic. And no matter what shape the world has taken by the time you hold these stories in your hands, I hope they do the same for you. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, and thank you, um, Let's Think Books. And thank all of you for being here with us. Um, and thank you for buying the book. It's really important to do that right now, like, like right now. <laughs> um, for context for what I'm going to read, um, this takes place in the late 1990s, and I was enlisted in the US Navy at the time. And it's called Not Anyone's Hero. I'm just gonna read the first part. When I found out I was pregnant, I didn't want to tell anyone. Not my mother, not my sister, not any of my friends, and certainly not anyone at my command. I'd taken the test in my boyfriend's bathroom. He didn't come home from the club that night. He didn't answer any of my pages. At dawn, I finally had to leave his place to report to the ship for duty. And as I started my car, he pulled up to the house in the passenger side of a nondescript green coupe that wasn't his. Some girl in a ratty weave was driving. He got out as I drove off, cursing him out while he laughed and said this was his friend's Mario, friend Mario's girl, that he'd been with Mario and them all night. I wasn't hearing it. He chased my car as I drove away, but he was still drunk enough and his pants were baggy enough to trip him up. I don't know how I got through the day, probably as quietly as I could and as snippily as I could get away with. What the hell was I going to do? I went to talk to the elder sailor in our birthing, a first class we called by her rank, Ian One, short for first class engineman. She could read the emotions on my face when I said I needed to talk. There was zero privacy on the ship. She had to kick Garcia out of her little office and shut the porthole, not leave it open like we were supposed to. I sat down in the metal chair bolted to the deck in front of her desk, and she looked at me with those red rimmed, hawk like eyes of hers that reminded me of my uncles in Michigan who drank from flasks all day. She was a mother figure to us, but her hardness was undeniable too, with that deep smoker's voice that carried through the birthing when she was ordering us to make our racks. So what do you wanna do, queen? She stated more than asked. I looked at my hands, at the bulkhead, the overhead, anywhere but directly at her face. I know a place you can go to take care of it if you wanna stay in, she said matter of factly. I knew I could do that if I wanted, that I probably should if I wanted to stay in the Navy. Nobody would have to know. You could do it on a Friday when you don't have duty and be back to work on Monday. I could go with you, she offered, unsmiling. I don't think Ian one ever smiled, even when she was laughing. We sure would hate to see you go. I was quiet for a while, weighing my options. I hated to disappoint her, and I wanted her to know that I was listening. I wished she 
or anyone would give me a reason to think I could continue on in the service, to have any hope that things would get better for me. As one of only 30 women on board a ship of 330 personnel, I endured daily harassment about what I wore, guys I dated, where I spent my time off duty, the novels I read. I witnessed secondhand the comments made about other female sailors, gossip about who was sleeping with whom, who would sleep with whom. The guys liked to complain about women sailors, but they gossiped more than any gaggle of housewives I'd ever seen. And their behavior, consistently heinous. On our last underway port visit, one of the officers got in trouble for having sex on stage with a stripper. That was the talk of the boat and led my direct supervisors to a confession about a souvenir they kept from the last overseas deployment. One of them reached into an old leather backpack that hung on a hook in Sonar 1 and pulled out a pink lace thong. Raucous laughter, salacious hooting, and a game of catch ensued. The guys tossed that stripper's panties back and forth over our heads, the only three women in the division who happened to be on duty while we sat at our workstations. You're not gonna tell on us, are you, queen? One of the Southern STG2s drawled STGs on our technician surface into mean second class. I just rolled my eyes and tried to keep my head down, study the maintenance manuals, mind my own business, but all the bullshit and ignorance and attempts at control wore on me. When I wouldn't date the Puerto Rican sonarmen my supervisors had approved for me, they gave me the ship jobs, like tying the ship to the pier and tossing the tobacco slot bucket over the side. I did not smoke or chew, and they assigned me the worst middle of the night watch every single underway. I felt harried, sleep deprived, and unsupported. I hate to leave the ship too, I said to Ian one quietly, but I think I have to. I'm gonna skip a little bit. You got anybody to help you, your mom or somebody? Ian one already knew who the father was. All the black people on the boat did. There weren't many of us, so we kept few secrets from each other. Resisting the urge to touch my fluttering belly, I looked her in the eye, my mother. I took a deep breath, pondering abortion. I can't kill it, Ian one, I said softly. That was the truth too, more than I wanted to admit. I could feel this growing life and held onto it like it would save me. Ian one looked at me for what felt like a long time. She let out a weary sigh. Well, she said, rising from her chair, good luck. I can't say I'm not surprised and I can't say I'm not disappointed. I'll do my best to keep you off the hard jobs in the meantime. I thanked her and went about my day. I still didn't know what to tell my boyfriend. I didn't want anything to do with him anymore. Could I raise a child on my own? I had no idea. I felt like I didn't know anything, like I was slipping away. I left the ship that night after working hours, threw a few things into my duffel bag, put on my civvies, and drove around base until I couldn't stand the motion. I drove until I reached the Atlantic, as close as I could get without driving into it. The reflected lights from the city shimmered in waves that failed to lull me, so I started to count them. I kept the car running, thinking that maybe I actually could drive into it, gun the gas until the pier disappeared under the wheels and gravity made descent fast, inevitable. I could disappear into the black and no one would know, except right at that moment, someone on watch pulled up, shining their lights into my Ford Escort. Hey, how's it going, the guard asked, feigning nonchalance. I can't remember if he stood next to my window with a flashlight or if his vehicle's headlights formed the harsh, bright circles invading the darkness. You're not thinking of going out there, are you? He asked gently with a smile. He asked what my command was. I managed to name a carrier on the opposite end of the pier, far away from where my actual ship was moored. He asked for my ID, but I shook my head. His mouth was set in a straight line, but he didn't get belligerent. His voice was gentle, his manner oddly comforting for a man in camos armed with a nine millimeter. Stay right there, okay? I nodded. I'm all right, I managed. As soon as he got back in his car to call for assistance and close the door, I panicked. If he saw my license plate, he would be able to find my name and figure out my real command, then tell me, tell them I was a suicide risk and I'd be fucked. Panic gave me some energy. 
Shaking, I backed away from the pier and raced toward the gate leading off base. This was before security got ridiculous, before the war started. I got out of there without any trouble and found the nearest motel. I paid for a night with my last $40, took my mostly empty duffel into a room and stripped down to my t-shirt and skivvies. I drank water and ate Cheez-Its and watched TV and wept. I'm gonna skip a little bit more. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I needed to ask for leave so I could figure it out. I had something like three weeks on the books, but I wouldn't get that. No one got more than a week unless somebody was dead or dying. Instead, I asked for three days. We weren't going underway and it wasn't that busy. My supervisors gave me a hard fucking time, of course. They wanted to know why I wanted leave, where I planned to go, tried to make me justify the trip by telling them my personal business. But I told them to mind their own. I knew the official rules said no specifics were required, so I used the language of those rules in my replies. I evaded their prying and finally the leave got approved late in the week. I drove north, all the way from Virginia to Michigan in one day to see my mother. When I got there, I did what I usually did on leave, slept for 12 hours after the grace of eating my mom's food. She made all my favorites, richly seasoned baked chicken, mashed potatoes with gravy, greens, cornbread, fresh lemonade with lemon she squeezed by hand on that old plastic juicer. The next morning, mom woke me before dawn and sat on my bed in her house coat and headscarf, the smell of turkey bacon wafting in from the kitchen, turning my stomach a little. I had a dream, she said. You pregnant, ain't you? A statement, just like Ian won. I nodded, my face buried in the pillow, trying not to burst into tears. I sat up, I, I could feel my body expanding. I felt out of control. I sat up, ran my hands through my super short curls and let out an impatient breath, willing myself to get it together. You gonna need some help, girl, my mom said. I nodded, you would have to come to Virginia, I said. All right, she said, without even a hint of pause. And that was that. I drove back to base the next day, 11 hours straight on the open road to think and scream and cry and laugh, to sip vanilla shakes from rallies, to listen to mixtapes, rapping and singing along with Method Man and Red Man and Mary J. Blige, and to wonder what the fuck I was going to do with a baby. Thank y'all. That was great. That was wonderful. And now for something completely different. <laughs> oh dear, it's always nervous reading something like this after something like that. Um, it's called My Nieces. It's really short. It's gonna take me like three or four minutes to read this and, that's, and I'm skipping around a little, so. I love my nieces. I have three in descending size, each radiant and perfect. Look at them out in the backyard, flipping around on the various apparatuses their father banged together. Of course, I feel fiercely protective. I tape their scrawl drawings to my refrigerator. I'll buy them some piece of plastic if they want it. Buy them all the crappy pieces of plastic there are. Look at these videos of their school performances, singing songs, leaping around a wooden stage. I watch with pride, joy. Other kids are there too, but I barely see them. Other kids are mere decorative streamers beside the stars of the show, my blood, my nieces. It's so weird. I become literally blind to other children when my nieces are there. Only if another kid topples off the stage or vomits or performs an extraordinary feat will I be dragged away. I am transfixed by the powerful pull of relation. I, who never wanted children, partly for the very reason that I did not want to be indifferent to all but what I called my own. If there are no nieces on the stage, just strangers' children on, say, YouTube, I do see them. I linger on this one's awkward dance, this one waving to the audience, or that one pouting. Each child is fragile and funny and shining. They all become my nieces. I think about terms like 
selfless motherhood and parental parental sacrifice. I understand what it is to love a child so much that you feel yourself becoming a better person just by looking at them. You'll forego any pleasure, any need to release ego for love. What a relief. What a revelation. It's a miracle. You can finally look away from yourself and love. I understand the temptation to interpret this as selflessness. And yet we know how sticky the ego is. It doesn't evaporate that easily. It transfers. Parenthood can be a brilliant, incontestable excuse for capitalist conquest, dynastic rule, for taking more than our share and believing it is an act of selfless love. As far as I'm concerned, the burden of proof is on the child bearer. Sure, I know I'm not perfect either. I'm not fooling anyone with my vegan entree and my rescue dog and my reusable bags and my Prius. But hey, at least I don't have kids. Ah, humans, we root for them. But should we? Look at all we've done. If only we didn't exist as individuals, it would be easy to dismiss us as a blight to scour out. If only we didn't exist as masses, it would be easy to love us one by one. We are an endless contradiction, two things at once at all times, infestation, miracle, even, especially my nieces. I write this in April, 2020. In the early days of the pandemic, I've been, I've been watching clips of the empty cities, of elephants emerging from the forests of Thailand, of the smog lifting and revealing ancient green mountains in the distance. There are more birds out this spring, more crickets, because humans have finally shut the fuck up. A planet with less us, a portent of the future, perhaps. A promise, a warning, a window, a door. I hope so, but by the time this essay appears, it will likely be nostalgia, a pause before we went back to the churning destruction in the name of our nieces. Thank you. Thanks, Deb, and thanks, Kadisha. Both of those were amazing. I'm going to read um, two poems, one, very short and one also short. Um, The first one is called A Question. What if it's true that we only live once? And if so, who are you to tell me how? I let you live freely, let you be yourself. Not once did I say stupid ass prick hypocrite. Take from me what you want. Try to control everything about me. Take the accident's future. Keep gone the night. Take that and use it to say you're better at seeing what is good for me and for the whole world. Oh, please, we are animals. And only if you can agree on that can we actually speak. I do not need you, and yet you seem to need to harness me to matters I cannot fathom being mother to. See how that works out. You won't notice the outcome. You'll be thinking of yourself and admiring the ass of another woman while your wife is knitting a gift for your throat, that tool you use to tell us who you are and what we have to be. And this is called A Set Sketched by Light and Sound. Outside there's barking. The radio's on loud, but no one is talking. The long day is darkening. To so, quote, they do not so properly affirm as enunciate. Like an angel wondered, like a Gabriel telling a girl the facts of life. You spread your legs, and yes, just like that, a sudden baby staring at the treetops outside the clear story windows of a church of one. The rain comes in around the frames, a thin trickle that makes the concrete go gray. 
a bell sounding, fine-tuned to a storm, a bell, or even better, a siren, an alarm that tells of the need to absent yourself, to lie down and behave as if no agency snug against the wall. The path formed by the water is a line that holds the brain hostage as a tail, becoming one more in a body of minutia, one n ending then, another years later, in a new now, listening to the outside come in through the window. Between time one and time two, a chasm opens. Into that you sweep the sounds. That in turn turns off the harsh light falling on the event, the curtain over who you were, you as everything that happened to you, you that time being told what to do. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of you. I'm such a, I'm feeling a lot right now. It's always such a special treat to hear contributors read from the book, um, which I've had the, certainly I've had the pleasure um, of witnessing that, but we've also done, I'm just back from tour and we've done a bunch of events where um, we invited local writers to read a selection from the anthology alongside their own work on the topic. So I'm sort of now on the heels of a bunch of those events and there's just something so special in hearing all of you read your own work. Um, so I'm feeling a little bit emotional. Um, I'm just going to read a couple more minutes from my own story in the book, um, which is the story of one abortion told in three sections from three different points of view. And what I've been doing um, at different events, usually at this point um, in the evening, is ask audiences if they prefer to be um, creeped out by an anti-abortion clinic um, volunteer or by a dude unaware of the harm he is causing. So I know since this is a, um, technologically a little bit more, it would be a little bit more of an elaborate effort to quiz everyone on this question. I can say I know from experience um, in this moment, a lot of people yell the words fake clinic, um, which is one of one of the options. The anti-abortion um, clinic is also known as a fake clinic, which is usually also my moment to kind of ask everyone in the audience if they're aware of what that is. And usually I get about half, um, half of the room where the audience nods and the other half look a little bit perplexed. So that's kind of also a way for us to mark something to talk more about if people are interested in the Q&A. Um, but I think if you kind of let just those words, anti-abortion clinic, fake clinics sink in, then it's sort of clear what they are. But I'll just say briefly that they, those are places that pretend to be abortion clinic and in fact um, do everything but and um, give a lot of misinformation um, to women. Uh, and that's really the least of the harm that they do, but that's a big part of it. Um, so this third section of the story is from the point of view um, of a volunteer at a fake clinic. They're fish, I should say they're officially called CPCs, crisis pregnancy centers, but fake clinic is accurate. Um, and this is just the beginning of the section. I'm bad at quoting scripture like I am bad at quoting anything because the letters dance for me when I most need them to be still. Marjorie tells me to memorize, tells me not reading well is no excuse. She's not very good at reading either, she says, but she doesn't let it, she doesn't let it get in the way of the work, now does she? All due respect to Marjorie. I don't think I let anything get in the way of anything else. There's more than one and also more than two ways of doing our work. Also, Marjorie is lying. She has a master's degree. She got this master's degree by being bad at reading? I don't think so. But I don't say any of this to Marjorie because she runs the center and I'm just a volunteer. I'm part of a program where if I'm good at my job, I'm supposed to get hired in the end, but how do you prove you're good at your job if your center manager says otherwise? Also, there's no point in arguing. I know the Bible says not to argue for nothing. I don't need to quote anything to know what's right. So instead of talking back, I make my voice small and say to Marjorie, unfortunately, my brain won't do that either. Maybe memorize. Maybe it's not that I make my voice small so much as it is my voice making itself small. This is the thing that happens in my throat sometimes. It is pitiful, but 
also effective. Marjorie feels bad for me when I get like that, says, it's okay, just find other ways to connect. Connecting is our goal. When you connect, you just see in the eyes of the woman that the baby will be safe. Quoting scripture is just one way we're taught to connect. And of course, it's only effective with women of faith. But the thing about people like Marjorie is that they imagine faith in every pair of eyes. Marjorie grew up in the South where, from what I understand, most people hold the Lord in their heart. And she only moved here when the center opened last summer. So in my opinion, she just doesn't get it. Majority of women around here, you quote scripture to them, they sprint for the door. Or they stare at you and, is this a real clinic? It's suddenly all over their face. And you better say something quick before they ask the question because it's a tricky one to answer. It's also delicate. If they ask, I never say yes, because that would be illegal and here at the center, we never break the law. I just nod. I say, you're in the right place, honey. Or I say, you are exactly where you should be. I'm gonna pause here, thank you. Thank you all so much for those incredible readings and for uh, just bringing this work to this audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. I want to remind the audience watching that now is the time to type up any questions you might have in the comments section. Um, so we are now officially in the audience Q&A portion. But while they are typing up questions, I want to ask, how are you all? Um, this has been a very tumultuous time. And I think it's important to check in on community and ask, like, how are you? Yeah. Um, I um, am OK as I can be, <laughs> I would say, if I'm honest, if I'm answering honestly. I was happy that uh, we did an event for the book in Providence the night before, and I was still in Providence when I heard the news. I was with one of our contributors, uh, Alison Asbach. Um, and I have to say, I was grateful. I'm very grateful to be here tonight, but I'm also grateful that I had a couple of days to feel without um, having to publicly interface in any way. I was sort of grateful that we had that event the night before. Um, and it's a strange thing. I mean, I think a lot of people have been saying in the last few days how even though we knew it still feels shocking and I completely understand that sentiment. I felt that way when the draft was um, leaked, which I'll parenthesize and say because there are uh, a lot of writers here around me and, and perhaps some writers in the audience that have had several conversations now when I say the leaked draft, writers they say to me like, the, a, a draft of the book was leaked? And I had to say, no, 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 that's SCOTUS, SCOTUS. Um, so that's just like writers being funny sometimes um, with our associations. But um, but I, I had that with the leak draft, that experience of, um, oh shit, like it feels very, can you say bad words, Shane, on this, in this lovely form? I've already okay, done it a bunch of that. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, so yeah, this time I don't feel shocked, I feel, it's a strange feeling that the image that has been coming up for me in the last couple of days is something around re, uh, rearranging topography. Like someone is like looking at a map going like these mountains are going to be here now and this ocean is actually going to be over there. And and I'm like, that's not that's not possible. That's not the world that I know or something like that. That's just like this. That's my feeling, which is different from shock. Um, but I'd love to hear from others. How have you been feeling? Um, I felt very angry. I'm surprised at how angry I am. And I've had more than one abortion. And um, I mean, I feel like I feel like there was a time when I wasn't embarrassed at all to talk about like, man, I've had more abortions than any of y'all, than all of y'all put together. And um, I went through, like, I've noticed over the last like decade or two, how I've gotten quieter and quieter about it because it's like, it, now I live in Texas, so you know you can imagine. But it's like 
I'm through with that. I'm like, I'm fucking done. I'm so angry. I'm, you know, like I've worked at an abortion clinic in Alabama. I worked, you know, I was a volunteer for NARAL for years. My grandmother had an abortion. I've had several abortions. Like I am proud and I'm like, I'm extremely angry and they have not heard the last of me. That's all I can say. They have definitely not heard the, heard the last from me. And I was out there protesting in 104 degrees here. It is unbelievably hot. And um, I like, I've just, I have had it with so many things. Um, so yes, so that is, I will, I would say something about Mary Jo Bang, but she's probably too personal. So I, I won't. Not about her, about me and well, our ship. I'll say a few things, which is, um, I just think it's so cruel and it feels that it's knowingly cruel because to make a person have a child, you either ignore knowing what it is to have a child, or you really want to ruin someone's life. And the problem is that that idealization of the unborn the fact is that you are bringing unwanted children into the world and many of them are not going to do well. And why would you want to submit children? If, if you want to glorify children and the unborn, why would you bring them into the world that is going to be cruel to them? It's just, it's insane. And it, there's something wrong with people's thinking and because it's at the level of their thinking, how do we ever, you know, approach that? Because they can't be made rational, apparently, because if they really care about children, they would be going into schools and helping kids learn to read. And they would be doing after school activities with living children. And they would be doing all kinds of things with living people but they make up these imaginary people and think that all of them are perfect, bring them on stage and we'll find you know, other families, we'll let them be adopted. You, you don't have you know, a teenage girl going through a pregnancy, her family surrounding her and then have her give up that child for adoption. You know, I, I had, I, was a, a teenager when and abortion was and um i would be happy to sit down with the supreme court justices who voted for this and try to tell them what that life is like for the child and for the mother and the families um they, they're doing no one a favor yeah and they know that the cruelty is the point the cruelty is the point yes the idea that we can reason with them or change their minds is the wrong road to go down. We have to fight and we have to take action every day. Um, whatever that action looks like for you. I have the one kid I didn't want anymore. <laughs> I said it 20 years ago. Um, I, I say it now, I don't have any more. So I have had a, an abortion since giving birth to my son. And you know, he's he's got a lot of health issues um, it has been a Herculean effort to get his health issues dealt with. So like, once again, if you actually did care about children, you would help them take care of their, their health and their learning situations, right? Um, I am yes. concerned about people who are disabled being forced to carry children. I'm concerned about folks with cancer who are for, forced to carry children or to have care withheld. I'm concerned about children being forced to carry children. I, I really appreciate your point, Mary Jo, about mm -hmm. adoption. My dad was a product of a rape and my grandmother was forced to go to an unwed mother's home and give him up for adoption. Um, yeah. And so, and he knew that. Yeah. She didn't know he knew, it was like a, a family thing, but it, it's, mm -hmm. It's something that stays in the family. You can't like hide that thing. These are relationships. It's not just like pressing a button and you adopt somebody. There are hundreds of thousands of kids who need adoption right now who are alive, actually alive. 
So I think I'm probably also angry, <laughs> but I'm also like very much of the mind that we need to do something. I already canceled like a bunch of subscriptions and spent that money donating to um, abortion rights um, and abortion access charities. And so I'm gonna get started with my phone calls next week after this busy week. That's a great idea. I should similarly cancel subscriptions and give that money. I love that idea. I think maybe that's a good moment for talking about charities and organizations doing um, such important work. That's a great moment to also mention Bridget, the Bridget Alliance, which I mentioned briefly in the forward. Um, and I think my, you know, they're uh, briefly, they're um, a service that plans and funds travel for people across the country who need to travel for abortion, um, for abortion care. And, you know, have been sort of saying that for a long time now that, that that's that anyone who's sort of a little bit tapped into what's happening kind of realizes that there's so much more of that in our future and that that's going to be one of the main, our main ways of responding in the next few years. And it's, um, has just gotten so much truer, um, you know, uh, very quickly. Um, so yeah, just want to make people aware, aware of, of the Bridge of Alliance. Uh, for people in St. Louis, there's also the Missouri Abortion Fund, which is another fantastic organization. Um, um, somehow, um, you know, protect our rights because it's 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 insane that they, they have taken away rights of 53 of percent of the population males make up, and they have, I mean, men can have you know, get as many women pregnant as they want and walk away from that. And that this is punitively being only something that is done to women is really so hard to get my mind around that in this day and age, when, you know, there's so much lip service about e equality, this is, this is the root of inequality is to limit women so that their lives are curtailed and um, that they could no longer have total independence. We saw that in the pandemic, right? Everybody so who lost really their jobs were women. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yes. But it's, it's, what, it's the, the same, the point that Khadija made earlier, it's like feature not a bug, right? It's not a coincidence that, that women are, um, that all of these aggressions toward women, like I'm also thinking of the connection between these two books, like the first anthology that was a Me Too anthology, and I'm, I keep mm -hmm. seeing those connections, these aggressions against women don't live in a vacuum, they're all interlinked, and there's a system, um, you know. Well, and particularly Clarence them. Thompson. I feel like Clarence Thompson is getting back mm -hmm. at Anita Hill and all the women who supported her and all of the other women that he, you know, would have liked to have done things to who resisted his flirtations. And now he has gotten back. In, well, in he, said he said that. that. I'm going to do it for 43 years. They tortured me for 43 years. I'm going to torture them back. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. So he needs to be impeached. I'm just waiting for the action. Like, so yeah. that's part of that, what we can do is, is compel our representatives to take action in this regard because he got to go. Yeah. Him and his old raggedy yeah. wife gotta go, and um, the other two that <laughs> lied gotta go. <laughs> I'm getting rowdy. I'm gonna be quiet now. <laughs> well, like, Texas is such well, a train it was bizarre when this case when this Sorry. case was being argued. Alito said he he made this statement that scientifically made no sense to me. He said so. The cells, the replicating cells that make up a child, they, and we have to allow that. And I thought, well, tumor cells want to go forward too. So, you know, the we not interfere with anything. And if you get cancer, does that mean you don't want, because the cell doesn't have a will. And I mean, again, we and, go down that road and it's that they just, we're just going and talking in circles like they are. Like, it doesn't make sense because it's BS. And yes. to for us to, on the news, they're repeating their little arguments. It's all BS. Yes. So it's time to just like 
put the bullshit in the garbage and do the things that protect people. I don't, I don't know how much hope I have, but I know mm. that I will fight. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I feel a lot, a, a lot of hopelessness, um, here in Texas. Um, you know, as I was starting to say that it is such a train wreck here, you know, the foster system here is just such a disaster and it's so heartbreaking. And, you know, in the local news here for the last year, it's just been, you know, place after place is um, being shut down, um, you know, care, places where they care for, you know, unwanted children because, um, you know, of the unbelievable number of abuses, sexual abuses, physical abuses against these kids, you know, and the, the places are so overcrowded and so underfunded and they don't have enough people to work there. And I mean, just the tragedies and then just how now they're, I mean, like, I'm just, I'm like apoplectic with just rage about, and I feel so helpless and hopeless because, you know, they're also trying to take away the vote here in so many just little tiny ways, just chiseling away. I mean, there's no hope. There's no hope. I, I don't know what to do. I, I mean, think there's always, like, I don't know. I feel like, I think about my ancestor, right? The one who was enslaved by John Marshall. My family's from Maryland. She was owned by this man named John Marshall and had seven children with him. And he freed the children, but not her when he died wow. and gave them land. That's my dad's side of the family. Wow. So if she could survive that, being kidnapped from her home, made into an indentured sexual servant and enslaved her entire life, if she could uh, live through that, I can fight for some basic reproductive rights and I can call a congressman, like that's that's leisure. So I I don't wanna say that um, it's not a natural thing to feel hopeless, but I refuse it. And I know that I'm, I'm not just gonna sit and suffer, that's not gonna work for me. I echo that and I think Deb, you're so special in that way where I know that even when and if you're hopeless, you're still fighting. It's just like how I think you're wired. Whereas I think a lot of people, and I can, and I know for me, as, you know, I grew up in Israel, and I know with Israeli politics, like when I get hopeless, I get stagnant. I have to to have or fool myself to believe that I have some hope because that's my engine. So it just feels like I've learned to kind of reconfigure myself, um, even sometimes bullshit myself, but kind of not let myself know that I'm bullshitting or something. It works. I have a, an internal system that somehow works in which I don't lose hope because I just know that it, to me, it feels like for me, it would be a privilege to, to feel hopeless because then I just stop fighting. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, when I say that I feel hopeless, I feel hopeless and enraged and all of those things. But I mean, of course, I'm going to keep fighting. That's what I was saying. I know you do. Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think the other thing that puzzles me is the idea of free will is part of Christianity. And so why, how can Christians legit, how, how can they argue that they should take away someone's free will? Because isn't that what is supposed to happen is we make our choices and then we pay for them um, with God. And so for them to play God. All religions are just use their convenience. It's just like whatever argument suits their convenience. Exactly. Any religion in, in the world, they do that. It's so boring. Exactly. It's so predictable. I'm so over it. The world. <laughs> yes. Yes. But what do you do about that? I mean, the stupidity in the world, the cruelty in the world. It's really hard to do anything about it other than what you can do in your own space, your local space, mm -hmm. your classroom and your family and your communities and the work that you do in your writing it does reach people. I think um, for me as a sailor, you know, mm -hmm being surrounded by a bunch of men who are trying to tell me who to marry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I turned to, to creative writing. You know, I took a poetry class and it changed my life. And it was a place for me to figure out who I was and, and what was possible and, and that what I was feeling had language. And so what we do is important. I hope that um, that feels clear to all of us. You know, we all need to be reminded of that, that the yeah. work will find the right people at the right yeah. time. 
yeah i keep wanting to say when we're having this conversation like but but it just feels so naive to be like but art <laughs> you know we have just, to be naive we're, we'll but be we have how exactly, we can imagine like, the world that we want yeah. If we and how are we gonna get out of bed in the morning? For me, really, if I don't believe that this, yeah, that this matters. How am I gonna look at this forever? That's not. That's not an option. <laughs> Deb, you talk about nieces. I have nieces. I have a little tiny seven-year-old niece who was on a manicure pedicure bus the other day. <laughs> I want her to have bodily autonomy. I feel like that's required. That's required. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised at how angry I am about this. I um, I teach at a, a prison here in Texas, um, and I haven't been there since the ruling, but I'm going on Thursday. And um, a lot of the guys, it's like this maximum security men's prison, and they have really long sentences. And a lot of them have kids who they don't get to see almost at all, and it's a huge heartbreak for them. And they have a really different view about this maybe because of that you know like or that's part of it i mean they're i, I mean most of them are pretty serious christians and they are um you know they like they don't think people should be having abortions you know and well I'm good for them yeah I mean, other people do what they need to do like i've just been very like but I'm, I have so much anger right now. Like it's just, it's going to be hard this time to go and just yeah. hear them cheering or whatever is going to mm -hmm. happen. I'm oh, I couldn't do it. Oh my gosh. I send you so much strength. I, I couldn't do it. Oh. <laughs> so that's, oh. yeah, that's not tomorrow, right? No, it's Thursday. <laughs> Good. I'm glad for you. you got one more day to prepare. <laughs> Yeah, just when you said the word tomorrow, I was like, uh, okay, it's one one more day. You go a long way when they're in these states. Yeah, I just also feel this is a distortion. Like a political, oh, go ahead, Mary Jo. Sorry. Just it's a distortion of Christianity. That's so right. they can be Christian, but they have to understand that the Christian God made scientific rules, and then now people make decisions living people and God and that person and work that out at the end, but you let people make those decisions and mm -hmm. you don't impose that you're playing God. And that, you know, not only is that anti-Christian, but that's the whole idea of Christ going and saying, you know, the Pharisees, you shouldn't be praying outside, you know, and, and trying to, show everybody how righteous you are to take care of your own situation, not other people's. They've, they've also messed everything up. separation of church and state, hello. And there's that. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm not a Christian, and so my cells are not doing what your Christian cells, what you think they're doing. It's and not just even science. You have no it's right. No. Shelly, I have That's a question why. for you. Pardon? How has it been? For, I, I had a question for Shelly. Mm -hmm. How has it been for you, like between the editing process and this tour, and like that time in between with everything that's going on? How are you taking care of yourself? Mm -hmm. um, there's the underlying premise in your question that I'm taking care of myself, which I appreciate the vote of confidence in me. Maybe you can um, start today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have been. I have been. I shouldn't say. I also work uh, as a as a life and creativity coach. So it should not say on camera that I'm not taking good care of myself while preaching that others do. Um, I have been, but it's, you know, it's it's certainly been hard to do that. Um, I think a good way to take care is what I was gonna make the point to Deb a moment ago about I think the, the importance, the value of women allowing ourselves to be angry, which I know I'm not manifesting right now because for whatever reason, I've been more sad and quiet since Friday, but I've been angry. I, I definitely get angry um, and and whatever it is that we're feeling, right? But there's something specifically wonderful about anger when it comes from um, women or any population that's been told not to be. I think that we're sort of doing whatever it is that we're communicating is of value. And then on top of that, when, the, when it comes um, in that box, it has this added value because we're also modeling like, yeah, we get to be angry. We're full human beings um, right. and there's such power in that too. So I think that's maybe one answer that I've been really trying um, to just let myself feel um, all the feelings and I've been feeling so much um, 
throughout this whole process, you know, as, as you all know, I started working on this book in 2019. Um, it was a different landscape. It was a different time. It was also already bad, which is why we started this project. In 2019 okay. alone, um, I think close to 50 laws in almost 20 states um, passed restrictions, uh, restricting abortion just that year, just that year. And, you know, that was so long ago. And you think about the case, the fact that in the Dobbs case, um, that just got Roe overturned, the clinic is the one remaining clinic in the state of Mississippi. What else do you need to right. know, right? The state of Mississippi, yeah. one abortion clinic. That's, I mean, that's just it's to think psychotic. about that. Yeah, exactly, the psychotic. And that communicates like just how long um, the fight that we just lost is really one that's of right. so many fights and the culmination of such um, escalating circumstances and such calculated effort on the other side that really in some way started 50 years ago almost started when I mean we passed, can't but, even get the ERA mm -hmm. passed so. yeah exactly exactly um so yeah I don't know if that's if that's an answer but it's the answer I have in this moment but thank you for the question we have <clears throat> we have hit the hour mark and I want to be respectful of all of your time as well as the audience time I want to thank you all so much for participating in this incredible book. Um, I want to thank the audience for being here, for listening to this discussion, for becoming inspired by this discussion, for taking this discussion into the world. So if you have any friends that need this book, that want this book, tell them that it is available at Left Bank Books. We are so happy and proud to be supporting a book like this. And supporting all of you, um, our participants this evening, Khadija, uh, Deb, Shelly, Mary Jo. Uh, Mary Jo, I love you. Uh, <laughs> so happy that you were in St. Louis. Um, and just say that like the fight didn't begin today, didn't begin on Friday. The fight began a long time ago and it will continue and we all have to do it. And we all need to help educate people and hold people's hands and hold each other's hands and it's part of a community that we are now i'm so happy that you all are part of my community and that we are able to fight together thank you, thank you so much thank you, thank you Shane. so much it was an honor all right and Shane. to the audience hope i hope you have a fantastic rest of your evening and we will see you again really soon <laughs>